Testing.
Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Amen. Thank you to our joyful noise bell choir. Appreciate you. That uh, beautiful, beautiful message there. You know, I never learned that, uh, that passage from Psalms, make a joyful noise, until I was too old to really put it to use. I could have used that when I was a kid, right? When my parents would get on me about making so much noise, I'm just like, Mom, Dad, I'm just doing what the Bible tells me to do, making a joyful noise. So kiddos, except mine, remember that one, okay? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Christian. Glad that you are here with us on this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. I think I did it. Went the whole season of Lent without saying, welcome to this season of Advent. I always interchange those all the time, so I think I did it this first time in like 20 years, probably. <laughs> Cheryl's like, ah, there's still time for you to mess it up, don't worry. Glad that you are with us, and uh, let us know that you are here with us. You can fill out your connection card, drop it in the offering plate uh, on the way out later on uh, following this time of worship, or if you're with us online, which we are certainly glad that you are, give us a shout out online. Let us know that you're here. A few announcements uh, as we uh, get ready for Holy Week. Uh, that will begin next Sunday with Palm Sunday. Uh, we're getting a number of things in order this week, so uh, you can uh, be a part of uh, all that's going on, and that includes our Wednesdays uh, in Lent. See, I almost did it right there. See, you planted that seed, and I'm like, oh, man. Wednesdays in Lent uh, is our last one this Wednesday, 6.45 to 7.45. The Christian Ed Department's going to be putting together goodie treat bags for next Saturday's uh, community bunny hop event for uh, uh, for our area kiddos that will happen at Silver Springs Park. We uh, are in need of uh, candy donations to fill those treat bags. Uh, we need uh, folks to come out to help stuff those treat bags. There's a lot of ways to be a part of that, uh, that event and that ministry. Uh, so you can... Um, uh, consider how you can be a part of that, donating candy, giving some, uh, some extra uh, donation to the C department, or come out on Wednesday. And then uh, next Sunday, as I said, is Palm Sunday. We'll have our, our children's processional at the beginning, so kiddos will uh, have an opportunity to, uh, to come in from the gathering area with their palm branches. So if there are any parents or grandparents that want their uh, kiddos to be a part of that, that'll be next Sunday. And then uh, we will uh, move into Holy Week with uh, our Monday Thursday Agape service on uh, Monday, Thursday, April 6th, um, and uh, uh, you can let us know that you'll be a part of that. You can just put that on the back of your connection card or give a call to uh, the church. You don't have to if you don't make a reservation. It doesn't mean you can't come, but we're just trying to have an idea of how many folks to be prepared for. Uh, we're still figuring out the, the Community Good Friday service, but uh, when we have information about that, we will get that out to you. And then do take note, we will have our prayer vigil on Holy Saturday uh, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m here at the church and more information about all of that will be in the April Pathways that is being put together and will be in your email inboxes uh, later on this uh, this week. So that's what's going on in the life of the church as well as a number of other things. So check out your bulletin and look for that uh, newsletter and you can uh, see what all is going on and how you can be a part of it. And let us... Uh, let us turn ourselves to this time of worship and be a part of it, and uh, let us continue to do so as we stand as you are able and join together in singing our gathering hymn. Let us sing.
Good morning. Good morning. How was your week? Good. Well, last Sunday when I asked that question, I saw some smiles and nodding heads, but I also heard a few moans and groans. <laughs> not, not picking on anybody, but. Um, so suffering and sorrow, feeling and doubts, even disillusionment, these are all part of life, as we all know. They were present in biblical times, they exist today. As much as we would like to think we have control over all aspects of our lives, the truth is we don't. True peace comes from knowing God is in control, wrote an unknown and very wise author. As Christians, we gather together each week to be reminded of this and to invite the Holy Spirit to come take control and bring hope into our lives. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship by participating in the responsive reading. There we go. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come to us in our suffering. Come to cheer us in our sorrow. Come to engage us in our failings. Come to persuade us in our doubting. Come to urge us forward in following Christ. Renew our strength, O God, as we wait upon you. Fill us with abounding hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us go now to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it is always good to be in your presence and to praise you on a Sunday morning. While we come to honor and glorify you, you know that we often bring with us heavy hearts and emotional baggage. Let us, through today's message, feel your energy wash over us, renew our spirits, give us comfort and hope to face whatever challenges come our way. Remind us that you will always walk beside us and that with you, all things are possible. In your name we pray, amen. So I've been reading a couple chapters every night in a book um, by my bedside about angels. I really like angels. Um, it's entitled Angels, Miracles, and Answered Prayers. It's by Kelsey Tyler. And yes, it's another book that came home with me after the church library cleanup. <laughs> um, in the book, the author shares stories of divine intervention. Angels are God's way of sending help and healing to those in need, she writes. In the stories, every time an angel appears, a sense of peace and calm washes over that person who interacts with the angel. What does the Bible say about angels? In Hebrews 13, verse two, it says, forget not to show love unto strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels without being aware of it. So look around you. There may be angels in our midst, some you know, and some you may not. Let us share God's peace and love with everyone around you. <coughs>
I want to invite any of our children uh, to come and hey, join guys. me for a children's message. Hey, hey buddy. Daddy. Daddy. Have a seat. <laughs> they sang Kumbaya 26 times. Wow. That's, uh, he counted. Of course you did. <clears throat> well, when I saw that was the back row singers, I thought it was going to be sung by, I don't know, by Gene Locke back there, Roger, Williams, Tim. I thought you guys were all the back row singers. No? No? All right. <clears throat> well, the back row singers that did come up, boy, you guys were fantastic, too, singing Kumbaya 20, 20 how many times? Six. 26 times. Fantastic. And you guys were sounding amazing there, too. Well done. We really had a fantastic musical worship service, and now you guys get me. Wow. All right. Sorry about that. Anyway, sorry. Right, so let's get to the children's message. Here we go. Oh, boy. Um, um, who was supposed to do the children's message today? All right. Yeah. Me? But um, yeah, I'll do the children's uh, message. Uh -oh. Children's message. All right, now go. <laughs> wow. Um, I taught him everything he knows. Okay. Um, are you sure it's supposed to be me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Um, all right. Uh, so. Yeah, here, here it is, right here. Um, I'll say uh, the leader part, and then you will say the people part, right? You guys got it? No? We, we already did this part, right? Oh. The people part. Okay. Um, um, uh, well, uh, let's see. Um, Holy Week events are coming up. Did, I already talked about those, didn't I? All right, all right, I admit. These are just the announcements and the response of reading. I. I, oh, wait, 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 here it is. I have it right here, the children's message. It's right here. Oh, gosh, it's not right here. This is just one of my daily life hack uh, calendar papers. Um, but, yeah, that's the children's message. It's, uh, uh, here it is. Here, you guys ready? It's very deep and theological. Need a repair manual for a broken item? On fixit.com, you can download the repair manual for almost anything. ifixit.com. There you go. That's a children's message for today, right? No? You're not buying it, are you? No. I don't even know how this got into my binder. Well, it seems that I have forgotten my children's message. Oh, uh, yeah, there are rocks up there. That's the, no, that's not the children's message either. I forgot. Have you guys ever forgotten something? Yes. Yeah? Have you guys ever forgotten to do your, yes. your homework? No. I don't no? Have homework. You don't have homework? <laughs> Lucky you, right? I don't have but <laughs> who, else, who here has forgotten to do their homework? Anybody? What did, you, what did you say to your teacher when they asked, where's your homework? Did you say, my dog ate it? I did it in You did it. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Don't give anybody any ideas here, right? So, well, sometimes when we're asked, you know, if we did something that we forgot to do, we, we kind of make up an excuse, like my dog ate it, right? Or maybe we, we try to, like, dodge the answer, right? Like, did you do your homework? Ah, uh, well, uh, you know, about that. Um, oh, look at the time. I got to go, right? That's... <laughs> the dog ate it? Well, we don't want to lie, do it, right? Or a goat? Yeah, goats eat homework, too. Goats eat paper. Goats do eat paper. But sometimes if we don't want to lie because we know lying's not good, and if we're already going to get in trouble because we forgot to do our homework, we may just try to dodge the question, right? You ever try to dodge a question like, did you do your homework? Did you... Brush your teeth. Oh, well, let me think uh, about that. Look at the time. I got to get to bed, right? You know? We don't answer the question. We kind of dodge it, right? Well, there's a story in the Bible about a guy named Ezekiel. And one day, God calls him into this field, right? And this field, well, it's not a very, very healthy field. In fact, it's downright barren. There's nothing growing there. In fact, there's lots of deadness all throughout this field. And in fact, there's some dead bones there. And God asks Ezekiel, he says, hey, Ezekiel, do you think these bones can live again? 
And Ezekiel's like, um, well, uh, <laughs> you know, he starts dodging God's question. Remember a couple of weeks ago when you guys were asking me questions and I was like not giving an answer? Yeah. Same thing again. He was dodging the question of God and he was saying, finally he came up with his great answer. Oh, God, well, you know. <laughs> and God's like, yes, I do know. And let me tell you what is going to happen. See, Ezekiel had forgotten. He had forgotten what God can do. That even when something seems like it's completely lifeless and completely dead, Ezekiel forgot what God can do. And God said, let me remind you what I can do. I can put life into these bones. I can raise these bones up. And let me tell you how I'll do that. I'm going to breathe life into it. So even, is, God was telling Ezekiel, even when we forget what can be done, God is always there to remind us and show us. So if you ever forget, if you ever forget that you can't do something, if you forget that, that you actually can do it and you think you can't, if you ever forget that, that, that you are loved by so many people, if you ever forget that, that, that you can't be forgiven or that you can, that's when we need to be reminded, like Ezekiel, that God can do those things, that God can forgive us, that God does love us without condition, and that God is always there with us. Are real? <laughs> so some, yes, yeah, skeletons are real. And we can remember that with God's breath, God is able to do what we think and what we have forgotten God can do. Let's pray together. Dear God, help us remember what you can do. Help us remember that your breath always gives new life. Amen. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity to transform lives, just as Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was transformational for all Christians. Help us to introduce people to you, dear Lord, and to your love. Continue to bless this church with our abundance that comes from you. May these gifts help do your work. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. God's word for us today comes from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. It is that familiar story of the Valley of Dry Bones. It wasn't too terribly long ago that I preached from this text, but it is part of this series that we've been focusing on, and still we rise. And so here it is, this story again. Ezekiel tells us, The hand of the Lord came upon me, and the Lord brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. The Lord said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then the Lord said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and I prophesied, and suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied, and as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Mortal, can these bones live? God has taken the prophet Ezekiel down into the middle of a valley and shown Ezekiel a field of dry bones that is lifeless, barren, and dead. I can imagine it's a rather startling sight, which is when God asked this startling question, Mortal, can these bones bones live. 
A question intended to get Ezekiel thinking about something that he hasn't thought about in a while and might just have forgotten. And you have to love Ezekiel's response. Oh Lord, you know. It's a response just like the man who was asked by Jesus a couple weeks back, do you want to be made well? It's a response to God's question, but it's not an answer. The scene painted in our text for today is of what is happening and has happened to the nation of Israel who has fallen into exile. The Babylonians have scorched the earth, sacked Jerusalem, and kidnapped the best and brightest from among the nation of Israel. The land is lifeless, dry. There's no breath. Nation given life at Mount Sinai now lay dead in this valley. From the moment the Israelites first stood on the edge of the Jordan River, they had been warned of the results of living without focus on God there in the promised land. They had forgotten these warnings, and consequently, they forgot God. And because they forgot God, they have crafted cheap replicas. Because they forgot God, they ignored God's call to extend justice to all. Because they forgot God, their worship became hollow lip service. Because they forgot God, they found out what life without God was really like. Dry, lifeless, barren, and dead. And though this text is about the nation of Israel, it is sooner or later about each one of us and even our church. We settle in and we settle down. We accept where we are even if it's not where we want to be and then we assimilate and acquiesce. And then we forget. We forget what we intended to do and be. We forget what God has called us to be and do. We forget what God can do. Mortal, can these bones live? It's not uncommon to hear Christians today speak in terms the ancient Hebrews might have used. I feel spiritually dried up. I haven't heard anything from God in years, it seems. My prayers feel as though they never leave the room. I believe in God, but it would just be nice if God would show up to me once in a while. These situations feel hopeless, lifeless, barren, dead. Perhaps it may feel that there's no God anywhere in sight. But Ezekiel in this vivid story shows us something beyond just a picture of dry, lifeless, barrenness, and death. Ezekiel shows us that even when it appears all has been lost, all has been taken away, all is gone forever, God is still able to breathe in new life. Though cries of the heart come from people who feel spiritually dead, God is able. And God will do what we have forgotten God can do. Because here's the deeper truth that we need to grasp. A healthy view of God and the Christian life has room for feelings of lifelessness and barrenness and dryness and death. There is room for such because real change comes through brutal honesty and vulnerability before God. Where we tell God, this is what I feel like. I am dry bones, God. The Psalms and the Lamentations model as much And great saints before us have endured dim nights of the soul where they have stood before God and confessed such. God shows Ezekiel that the total death and despair of God's chosen people 
is them being recreated. And it comes first through embracing our spiritual despair, recognizing what we have lost, what has been taken away, what appears to be gone, once was once before but no longer is, and certainly what we have forgotten. And what all this is, what we have forgotten, is the breath of God. The breath of God that we ourselves have actually walked away from. What we then have to come to terms with is that we cannot receive this new breath on our own. It has to be given and it certainly has to be received. God offers God's breath when God asks, Mortal, can these bones live? Israel was in exile in Babylon. The people were convinced they would never be able to return to their homeland. They had completely lost hope because they had forgotten what God can do. And in the story of the dry bones, which was a vision to Ezekiel, reassuring him that despite the fact that their hope was dead, God would still give life to God's people. But the way God gets to the point isn't very direct. It's almost a trick question in a way. Do you think these bones can live? Asks God. I mean, who ever looks at skeletons and thinks, sure, these bones can live? Who looks at dry barrenness and says, yep, this is definitely the place that new life is going to spring forth? So it's not surprising that Ezekiel doesn't actually answer the question and instead, instead says, only you can answer that thing is, even if Ezekiel meant to dodge God's strange question, that answer, you know, God, has forced Ezekiel to open himself up to whatever God's answer is. Because here's the thing. Ezekiel doesn't believe the bones can live again because he has forgotten And yet here is God still about to use him as an instrument of divine purpose, even though Ezekiel has forgotten. He doesn't know how God will achieve this, but God is able to use him nevertheless. And why? How, even? After all, Ezekiel doesn't believe the bones can live. Ezekiel has forgotten what God can do, but though he may not believe, though he may have forgotten, what Ezekiel does have is a willing and open heart. See what's going on here? God chooses the people God chooses regardless of whether they think they're equipped for the ministry, regardless of whether they think they know or have forgotten what God can do. We are once again seeing how God calls and uses unlikely people who have shown themselves quite clearly to be ill-suited for God's divine purpose. I mentioned several of them last week, and yet there are still others. Moses, who said he wasn't a good speaker. Jeremiah, who thought he was too young. Mary Magdalene, who thought she was too much of a woman because women were told they couldn't be used. Saul, who became Paul, who first persecuted Christians. The disciples, who were illiterate fishermen. Elizabeth, who was too old to have a child. Few believe they could be of use for God's divine purpose. But even at their driest season, even in their most barren of time in their life, even though they had forgotten what God could do, they still opened themselves up 
to God's call. And because they did, they themselves and countless others could all say, and still we rise. The story of the Valley of Dry Bones implores us to ask ourselves, do we struggle to believe? Are we dodging God's questions to us? What have we settled for? What have we acquiesced to? What have we forgotten? So that we can say, and still we rise, we must ask ourselves these questions, ask them of ourselves, and then together we have to ask, where do we see dry bones in this congregation? Are there areas where we're doing things the same way we always have? Are there places where we've been focusing so much on material questions that we have been neglecting the breath in the divine that surrounds us? Are there places where we've been relying on ourselves to answer problems and not making room for God to help us? We can also ask, where do we see dry bones in this community? Do our schools need help? Are there immigrant families who need a community to be part of? Are people in the community so engaged in commerce and business and busyness that they don't have any space in which to be calm and reflect and simply be? This scripture teaches us something about our preparedness to be instruments of God's activity in the world. While we need God's spirit, God is also using us the way God had Ezekiel gather the winds to breathe life into the dead places. So what does it mean for us to ask God to breathe life into us? What does it mean for us to share that breath with others? When we read this text, the scene we hear clearly comes into view and we can see that lifelessness, that barrenness and all that death. That's when God asked that startling question, intended to help Ezekiel begin to remember what he had forgotten. And Ezekiel's response is often our response. It's a dodgy, oh God, you know. To which God says, yeah, I do know. I know what's going to happen, so let me tell you. I will cause breath to enter these bones, these dry, barren places, and as a result, they will rise up. They will rise up and they will be transformed. They'll be transformed into the new life that I have planned and called, and they will remind you what you have forgotten. These dry bones that once had breath, that once had sinews and ligaments and tendons holding them together and in place, once covered with skin, once alive, they will now, because of God, be recreated into something new, something alive again. That is the vision God casts for Ezekiel and Israel who were in a dry, lifeless, barren place. That is the vision that reminds us what we have forgotten. That God is able to breathe new life where there is barrenness and where there is death. And we are also reminded that even if we don't believe it, if we will just open ourselves even a little. God will use that. We'll use that to make it all happen around us and in us and through us. 
Mortal, can these bones live? Can these bones be dead? And yet, say, and still we rise. What is our answer? Are we not sure? Have we forgotten? Or is our answer something else? Amen. Friends, let's join together and go to God through our prayers. Let us pray. Holy God, have we forgotten? Have we forgotten who you are? Have we forgotten what you can do? Have we forgotten what you have done? Have we forgotten what you promised us? Have we forgotten you never break your promise? Have we forgotten you sent your one and only Son not to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through him? Have we forgotten, though you call the most unlikely to do what seems to be too hard or too improbable, you always make them capable and successful? Have we forgotten that nothing in this world, not even death, can separate us from your love? Have we forgotten you have equipped all your children and made them able to fulfill the ministry you have called them to? Have we forgotten what it means to be able to walk with you in each step of our lives? Have we forgotten that whatever dry, barren, lifeless place we find ourselves, you have and will again breathe new life if only we seek you out? Gracious God, we say we want transformation. We say we want to rise up to new life. And this is true without a doubt. But we have forgotten we have forgotten you were transforming Ezekiel long before your conversation with him ever happened. You had already been at work moving him from a place of despair where he was only able to respond saying, you know God, to a place where he could instead say, yes, Lord, I remember you can. Help us remember that like Ezekiel, long before we ever realize, you are at work. Moving us from a place of despair, from a place of forgetting, to a place where we too can say, yes, Lord, we remember that you can. For it is when we remember what we have forgotten that we are able to say, and still we rise. May you continue this work in us. And may we never forget what you have done and what you are always doing. In our prayers as we lift them to you in this time of holy silence. All this we pray in the name of the one who came to show us the way through the dry, barren, and lifeless valleys of life. Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts 
and as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us gather around our Lord's table and let us do so as we sing together our communion hymn. This do in remembrance of me. These words of Jesus are extended to us week after week so that we can come to this table and be reminded of what we know, be reminded of what we hold in our hearts, be reminded of what we build our faith upon, and be reminded of even what we have forgotten. This do in remembrance of me. Let's come to this table and be reminded. It was on that night before Jesus was crucified when he gathered with his disciples and shared with them a meal. During that meal, Jesus took a loaf of bread and blessed it and broke it. And giving it to his disciples, he said to them, This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat of it and do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, Jesus took a cup and giving it to his disciples, he said to them, Take and drink from this, all of you. For this cup is my shed blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. Let us come to this table and be reminded of these gifts, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Dear God, we come to this table to remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He lived among us full of grace and truth. He forgave sinners, healed the sick, and taught the world how to love. He he was sacrificed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. As we participate in communion now, let it be a reminder of the body and blood of Christ that was given for us because of your love. May we be inspired to share that same love with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
not just a question, it is an invitation. It is an invitation to step deeper and closer into relationship with the divine. How will we respond? Let us consider our response to this invitation as we stand as you're able and join together in singing our hymn of invitation in number 602. O Master, let me walk with thee. Let us sing. know those dry, barren, lifeless places. We've all been there. And we all have been brought through those places. And we certainly know who it was that brought us through, what it was that was breathed into us so that we could make it through those dry places. All of us have heard that question in some form or another, O mortal, can these bones live? And we all have responded in some way or another, yes, Lord, though we might have forgotten, we remember now. When we go forth from here, without a doubt, we will cross paths with those who are in dry, barren places. And we will have an opportunity, an opportunity to ask them if they know. I wouldn't recommend asking them, mortal, do you know if these bones can live? But God will equip you with the right words, the right invitation to engage them and help them to form a response, maybe not an answer. But maybe then that you have a response as well, perhaps an invitation to draw closer to the divine themselves, maybe right here on a Sunday morning. But in some way or another, offer them that breath, that opportunity to find it, so that they too can know what you know. So as you go forth to share that good news, may the grace of God, the constant and abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, and the unconditional love of Jesus Christ rests and abide with each and every one of you, now and forevermore. Amen.